Greetings, everyone. My name is David Fox Estrin. I am the founder and CEO of Together We Remember. Um, we are honored to have you join us today for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, today's program it is presented by Heidelberg University, the Lickman Baim Genocide Lecture Series, and the Together We Remember Coalition, an international network of Holocaust, genocide, and human rights institutions all over the world dedicated to turning collective memory into collective action in the fight against hate and to make never again a reality once and for all. This particular initiative is kicking off the Ohio Remembers Initiative, which is the product of 10 years of work. Um, it was sparked by my grandfather, a survivor of the Auschwitz and Mauthausen concentration camps and his liberator, Don Baim from Patton's Third Army, and uh, who liberated my grandpa's concentration camp. And so today the legacy continues and we are sharing a program for educators, students, uh, and folks all around the world who can help us and join us in our mission of turning collective memory into collective action. Um, I am joining you today from the land of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts, otherwise known as Boston. Um, and I'm really excited to also uh, be joined by uh, um, Julie Arnold from Heidelberg University. Julie, can you hop on and join us? Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to give you just a little introduction about how this came to be at Heidelberg. Um, in 2010, Heidelberg hosted a memorable program when Mr. Jimmy Lickman, a Holocaust survivor, met Mr. Don Bain, who was from Heidelberg's class of 1951. Mr. Bain was a US veteran who was a direct participant in the liberation of the Mauthausen concentration camp. This program triggered the establishment of the Lippmann Baim Genocide Lecture Series. Since 2010, the series has continued hosting an annual program to honor survivors and liberators of all forms of genocide. Our purpose is to bring light to the human tragedy of genocide for the campus, local area schools, the community, and like today, even beyond. I'd like to thank David and our speakers and welcome everyone here. I think you will find this presentation memorable and inspiring. Back to you, David. Thank you so, so much, Julie. And thank you to the entire Heidelberg University community for nurturing this program over a decade and, and hopefully the next decade of programming to come. Um, I wanna share a couple of reminders. So this program is being recorded, it is being streamed on Facebook. Hello to everyone watching on Facebook. It'll be available to all the educators and students watching afterwards with extra educational resources. We've got a variety of programs that'll be coming up in February and all and culminating in April for Genocide Awareness Month. Um, I also wanna share that today's program will be um, captioned as well. So if you need that service, then that is available to you. Uh, and finally, a, a trigger warning um, that today's program will explore pretty um, heavy content at times. So if you need to take a, take a step away, take a breath, um, please take care of yourself. That is really of the utmost importance as we explore this subject matter. So now without further ado, I love to stop my screen share and welcome onto the screen um, our speakers for today's program, Dr. Noemi Lopian and Derek Neiman, please come and join us. Um, I won't go through uh, extensive intros. They have incredible bios and backgrounds. You'll hear from them. Um, but I know today's program focused on speaking across the divide will be incredibly powerful. So Derek, over to you to begin uh, our storytelling. Thank you very much, David. Um, maybe I should start by saying how we came together and really it was an act of courage, imagination and determination that brought us together. I was speaking about my grandfather's story, the story that you will hear soon. And I was speaking in a synagogue. And at the end of the meeting, a woman came up from the back and said, I want us to speak together. That woman was Noemi. And perhaps for the first time in the world, we've never heard of it from anywhere else. We have the daughter of Holocaust survivors and the grandson 
of a Holocaust perpetrator speaking together. And you might say, well, what has old Europe got to offer modern America? This is a story where practically all the people involved are dead. Hardly any of us here today were alive when it happened. But this is a story for all time. And I'm hoping that when you leave this meeting, you will have courage, determination in your hearts. Because we want to encourage kindness instead of hatred and understanding instead of ignorance and prejudice. And I'm gonna start by handing over to the woman who showed those qualities and continues to show those qualities. And Noemi will tell us her story. Thank you. Hi. Can't disable my screen. Noemi, uh, now you should be able to start your video. There we go, we see you. Thank you, Noemi. Okay. Hi, everybody, and Derek, who's become now a dear, dear friend of mine. Thank you for that lovely introduction. My story is that I grew up in Germany, in Munich, the, part, the town that played a big part in Nazi Germany and Hitler's seat. I, as a child, was totally unaware of that. My parents, both survivors, didn't speak about the Holocaust. I grew up with a love of the town. Munich, particularly Christmas time for a child, was utterly magical. It was like fairyland, the decorations, the town. So I had a love for the city and the love for the people. More so, my father, after the Holocaust, studied medicine and dentistry, practicing as a dentist. And he adopted, which wouldn't be allowed today, I'd say it's not very kosher, he adopted uh, his patient as our grandmother. She became our adopted grandmother. We loved her like we would love our real grandmother. She was German. We don't know where her husband was in the war, it wasn't spoken about. I don't know where her parents were in the war. I don't know what she did in the war. She taught us about her religion and uh, she taught us the love for the people. And I admire my parents to this day for that. But it's taught me a huge lesson intolerance and even today my mother just said you can't bag a whole people into one bag it's down to individuals and that takes me really also to Derek's introduction the power of individuals that each of you can do something we each including Hitler was an ordinary person and we're each capable of extraordinary things but back to Munich I grew up knowing that I was Jewish and grew up both my parents almost unspoken saying I mustn't draw attention to myself and I always felt like I wanted to disappear and that lasted for an entire life except when I do these talks and the other thing also was that I never came forward as being Jewish I hid my Jewishness when I could if I was asked if I was Jewish directly I wouldn't lie but otherwise I would never volunteer the information I was afraid I was afraid of getting hurt. I never actually verbalized that to anyone really, nor my parents. How did I find out about the Holocaust? In Munich, I went to a non-Jewish secondary school and uh, religious lessons were obligatory. And I was, went to, and so therefore, because I was Jewish, I didn't go to the, um, Christian religious lessons, I went to an ethics lessons together with everybody else who was of different faith or no faith. And one week we had the Holocaust. And dear friends, I can't remember what was said, not because it was a while ago since I was a teenager, because immediately after the lesson I forgot, because I was so shocked. But all that I remembered then and all I remember to this day are three pictures. One, a container full of hair. The second, glasses. The third, shoes. I turned to my peers 
with questioning eyes, do you know anything about this? They returned my stare with the same questioning eyes. I went home to my mum that day and asked her, is this really true? And it was. I shelved this story. Mum didn't expand and uh, I carried on life. I, I, I lost my dad at the age of 12 and so we had enough to be getting on with. And at the age of 13, we left Munich, moving to Manchester, where my mother had two sisters. And it was a very healing time for us because the community was so warm and kind and welcomed us with open arms. However, I grew up in my mum's house in Munich and in Manchester with Die Lange Nacht, The Long Night, on my mother's bookshelf. Her room and her shelves were full of ornaments, very ornate, but the long night had a place on its own. When we used to ask my dad about the past, because we couldn't, he was an elderly father, and we wanted to imagine him as a youth and what he was like. He'd tell us nice stories, and he always said, the rest is in the long night. But friends, even if I was the most imaginative person on this earth, I couldn't have imagined the Holocaust, what had gone on. And I'm grateful that he didn't tell me that I was allowed to turn to it when I was ready. And I read it at the age of 36 in German. And when I closed the book physically, I had a choice. And I felt that if I closed the book and wouldn't look at it again, then I'd close the book to my dad to his parents that were gassed in 1943 in Auschwitz, to his younger sister, Naomi, whose name I carry, who was a young teenager, and to his little brother, Judah. Not only would I close it to them, I would close it to his friends, to his community, but above all to those who never had a voice after the Holocaust, who were murdered, the six million, a number that I cannot fathom. I'm not very good with numbers anyway, but do you know how big is a football stadium, a concert hall? It was of incomprehensible magnitude. I want to now turn to my father's own words and read you some passages from The Long Night because I feel that the authentic voice, his voice, says it how it is, the real witness, I would say so much better than I can paraphrase. After so many years, can one now relate events, thoughts and feelings as one saw, thought and felt them? Probably not. How does a person feel when he sees a companion being shot the moment he stops walking and realizes he can barely walk himself? Of course, at first he carries on. He wants to live. He reaches for his companion's hand to support himself. But he, the companion, is at the end of his strength. He pushes the hand away. He won't support the laggard. The weak one is left behind. But that one must have seen for oneself the lifeless face, the flickering eyes of a person about to confront his fate. The bullet strikes his neighbor, and soon, he will also be struck. Who can say what such a person experiences whilst walking the final steps of his life? Who can describe what he feels and suffers in these moments? And what did I myself experience on this day? As chosen inmate, I had to carry the bread sack for the guard and the last one in the line had to march next to him and the Nazi man called the SS man. The SS man shot all who stopped and the guard had to record their concentration camp numbers. I looked into the barrel of the gun before the bullet struck the neck of the tottering person, looked at the thin stream of blood that ran slowly as life departed the body. I observed the SS man and saw how he ate his sandwich with appetite whilst continuing to walk despite his bloody deed. In the nearby fields, there were farmers sowing 
and at one of the houses by the roadside, a woman was watering flowers. In this moment, a bullet pierced the head of a straggler. A small stream of blood ran down the temple. And all that happened in the midst of built up fields and lovingly tended flower gardens. Are we still living in this world? Or was this a nasty, unending nightmare? How was it possible that people within 50 meters were quietly going to work whilst in their midst, exhausted, defenseless people were being shot? Friends, in 1928, Hitler had a popularity of 2%. In 1932, he had 37% votes. In 1933, he came to power. Never underestimate a fringe political party. Politicians, when they say things, they usually mean things. We all have choices. We all belong to one race, and that's the human race. I want to tell you, end by telling you about my dad. I told you what happened to him after the war, but he was 17 in 1939 when the Germans invaded Poland. He went into frequent hiding in this time and already then witnessed men's beard be, beards being torn out and being trampled on and frequent roundups. The night that he decided not to hide, March 1941, he was 19, he was found by the German Nazis, beaten by clubs and taken to the first labor camp, Grünheide. Subsequently, he went to seven labor and concentration camps numerous death marches and was liberated by the Americans April the 30th, 1945. He went to a DP camp and to hospital. And like I said, studied medicine and dentistry. He married a French lady, my mum, Rene. Rene never told my dad Ernst about her experiences in the Holocaust. They never spoke to each other about either experiences. Rene, my mum, only told me 10 years ago, roughly, when we had the Jewish Holocaust commemoration, Yom HaShoah. Since then, Rene speaks rarely. She was a little girl of 10 when the Gestapo imprisoned her in Anmas, the French Swiss border town to Geneva. Rene was questioned at gunpoint by, gunpoint by two Nazi officers. One, Gestapo Myers, she remembers to this day because he had unnaturally blue piercing eyes. Are you Jewish? What's your name? What is your parents' name? Where do your parents live? Are you Jewish? With a gun. Renee was in the interrogation room with her older sister Helen, aged 13, and her younger brother Joey, nine. One day when they were interrogated, a young boy, was left having been beaten and tortured on a plank in the side of a room to show the children what happens if they don't, in inverted commas, please the Nazi officers. Rene was entrusted to a young group leader, Marianne Conn, age 22. And she was meant to be taken, Rene, across uh, France to Switzerland to safety. Unfortunately, on the way, the Germans caught Marianne my mum and a group of 32 children. However, Marianne overall saved 200 children. Marianne herself was tortured, raped, beaten and shot in July 1944. Subsequently, the Lord Mayor of the town of Anmas saved my mum and the group of 32 children by making a pact with the Gestapo, allowing them to flee France as the Germans were losing the war and he would take the children. He had to still promise the Gestapo, that, that's the Nazis, that at any time they would return, he would have to return the children. And were he to do anything out of order in the Nazis' eyes, the Lord Mayor and the children would be shot. Rene was brought to safety by the Lord Mayor and six months later was reunited with her parents. I hand over to Derek, thank you. Thank you, Noemi.
moving and eloquent. And we've heard from people who suffered, and now it's, it's my story, and I'd like to share my screen with you. And I'll say before I do share this screen, that these photographs stayed hidden for the best part of 70 years, apart from the first one. And the first one is Glasgow, Scotland. This is a team photo. This is me at the front, my big brother behind me, and my dad at the back. And it was pretty cool to have a dad who came from a different country, especially Germany, because every Christmas, we used to get these huge boxes full of candy. Oh, it was absolute bliss. We went to Germany once as well to meet my dad's brother. My dad had emigrated after his sister married a Scottish soldier. I knew his father had fought in the First World War, but my dad told me that he was just a bank clerk, that he'd done nothing. He didn't tell me about what he'd done after that. And I discovered my grandfather's real story quite by chance when I did an internet search at the age of 50. I'm now going to follow my grandfather's story. We can find out how an ordinary man began to do extraordinarily evil things. It started so innocuously. He fought in the First World War, millions did. After the war, he married his childhood sweetheart. Look at the tenderness shown between them. He started raising a family. He'd moved to the city of Dortmund by now, 1928, his first two children. As an old soldier, he took photographs. Here's a military parade in the city centre. There's nothing throughout the 1920s to suggest any political affiliations. And then suddenly, in 1930, he joined the Nazi party. And this is a, a parade of the, the Nazis' private thugs, the, the brown shirts, the stormtroopers, going through a communist district of a city that was not sympathetic towards the Nazis. But for whatever reason, my grandfather followed Hitler. He didn't just follow him. Hitler is now in power when this photograph is taken. My grandmother is pregnant with my dad. And my grandfather has his bank job, but he also is a volunteer in the evening for the Nazi party. He knocks on people's doors and asks them for their political views. And if they don't agree with those of the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler, he's supposed to report them to the secret police. And that could mean concentration camp. A year later, my dad is born and they have three children. These look like happy little children. But the man behind the camera is now in a difficult position. He's lost his job for whatever reason. He says to his landlord, I can't pay the rent. He has a friend though. His friend says, I know somebody who could get you a job. Somebody who went to the same school as you. My grandfather then spoke to a man who was very senior in the SS, the state-sponsored organization of fanatics. And so my grandfather went to the very dark side. He went away to Southern Germany, to Bavaria, where he trained to become an SS officer. He took photographs of his fellow SS officers. It was a small community then, he was supposed to drink and socialize with others of the SS. He was a socialite with people who became concentration camp commandants. And he took this photograph from the exact location of Dachau concentration camp today. My grandfather at first was an auditor for the SS. He kept the books. By 1938, He'd been moved to Berlin. He now had a chauffeur taking to work. He had a 
great uniform. He was working for his country. He was patriotic. He felt he was doing the right thing. That's what he sheltered behind. His children, he now had four children. And this looks like a, a happy scene. The grown-ups were happy too. Here's a New Year's Eve party. But bear in mind that this photograph of the adults celebrating took place six weeks after an event called Kristallnacht, when the Nazis, the government, urged its mob to smash and destroy Jewish-owned shops, burn the synagogues, and take many Jews, beat them up, kill them even, put them in concentration camps. There is a dissonance in the 500 photographs that I own, family photographs. We have this scene of a happy family. My aunt on the right seems to be having a wardrobe malfunction. My dad at the front is hitching up his trousers so hard, it's amazing he managed to have two children. But while this was going on, Noemi's father was being arrested and taken into captivity for four years. And people in the centre of the city were being bombed and killed. But this was a Nazi estate. This was the estate for the elite. What was your dad like? I once asked my father. He said he was a, a remote, distant man. He was always going on business trips, my dad said. He would go away for a few days, come back, and then he'd be getting ready to go on others. The rest of the time, he kept himself to this himself. He did the gardening in his SS uniform. My dad's older brother ended his school life at the age of 16. By now, Germany was close to losing the war. They took on everyone. They canceled school for all boys. My uncle was sent to man the guns to shoot at the American and British bombers. And when his friend's head was blown off, he decided he would join the army and fight. And this is him pictured with his mother, Christmas 1944, the last photograph of him. He joined the tank regiment where the chances of surviving were less than 5%. The family hung on in Berlin until the end of March, when my grandfather came home one night and announced that the family were being relocated. The office was being relocated to the Alps and they would leave in a couple of days. And that was just what they did. And on the way to the Alps, they stopped at a place that my grandfather knew very well, Dachau concentration camp. My wife and I took the same trip nearly 70 years later. And before we left, my dad told me something on the phone that he shouldn't have said. But dementia had loosened his tongue. I'm sorry, this is going to be the hardest part of the talk. This is what my father told me. He told me that the family was housed in a barracks hut, overlooking a long, low building with a tall chimney. My dad could remember being in his bunk bed. His parents were standing at the window. His mother said, you know what they're doing in that building? His father said, no. His mother said, they're killing them. They're killing the Jews and they're burning their bodies in there. His father said, no, they wouldn't do that. His mother said, of course they would. Can't you smell the flesh? By now I knew just who my grandfather was. I knew that his business trips were to concentration camps. His workers were slave laborers. I came out of speaking to the historians at Dachau, having asked the question, could my grandfather 
have not realized what was going on? Could he see the skeletal figures, the beatings, the dead bodies, and not understand the scale of what was happening? And they said, it is impossible. I came out, my wife took this photograph, and I have no memory at all of her taking it. The family left Dachau and made for the Alps, just as we did. They came, as we did, to this valley, and they went up and up to a big chalet at the top. And there they waited until one day, my dad playing with his little brother, and with his sister, saw an American Jeep coming up the track. Four heavily armed men jumped out. One of them grabbed his sister, my dad's sister, stuck a gun in her back and said, take us to your Nazis. And with that, my dad watched as the soldiers beat his father up a bit and took him away. He served three years, just three years, in an internment camp for his crimes. The rest of the family, what could they do but go down to the nearest town? The war was over. And this is an incredible picture because this is a picture taken by an American GI. My dad is wearing the GI's helmet. My uncle is wearing a little cap that an American soldier made for him. The war had ended the day before and the Americans played with the kids, the local kids, because that's what soldiers do when the war is over. The family returned not to Berlin, for they no longer had a house there, but to their in-laws in the Pied Piper town of Harmel. And that was where both my grandparents died before I was born. My dad told me after I'd revealed that I knew who his father had been, that his father regretted what had happened. But to this day, I don't believe that my grandfather regretted what he had done or what the Nazis had done to the millions they killed. I think he regretted that Germany had lost the war. And all the time I was researching and writing my book about my family story, I was guided and supported by a man in Germany called Bernhard Gelderblom. Bernhard's father had committed atrocities in the Second World War. And Bernhard could accept that, but what he couldn't accept was that his father said, and I would do it again. When Bernhard retired as a history teacher, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to teaching children in his local town and the surrounding villages about the Jewish communities that had lived there. Not only that, he encouraged the parents to visit the graveyards and repair the gravestones, the Jewish gravestones that had been smashed by the Nazis. Bernhard was my moral compass. He's still doing it today. And so we have two families, not just from very, very different backgrounds and different standpoints, but two families who treated their stories in very different ways. Noemi's parents, both parents, willing, able and wanting to tell the world what happened. And my family, pictured here in Glasgow, like many who stayed in Germany, wanting to forget the past, wanting to pretend that it didn't happen, denying the opportunity to learn lessons from what happened. Because friends, I don't think my grandfather was an evil man. There were half a million Germans who took part in the Holocaust. They weren't all evil people. Most of them 
were ordinary people who persuaded themselves that what they were doing was right, right for them, convenient for them, to their advantage. That is the lesson for me, that this can happen to anyone, that anyone can do the kind of things that my grandfather did. Thank you. Derek and Noemi, thank you so, so much for having the courage to um, share your stories with us today. It's so important that we share these different perspectives. I think it's really unique to have the opportunity to hear from the daughter of survivors as well as the grandson of a Holocaust perpetrator. It's certainly unique when I first you know, met the two of you and, and you shared your story with me, um, it, it changed my outlook. Um, uh, and you know, I'm the grandson of four Holocaust survivors, so it was deeply personal. And it honestly was really hard to listen to both of your stories, but I know how important it is. Um, as a reminder, I wanna invite all of our viewers joining us from around the world uh, to share any questions that you might have for Derek or Noemi in the Q&A feature that you see in the bottom. We'll have time for questions from all of you uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, now I'm going to uh, ask a few questions to foster some dialogue between our wonderful panelists. So uh, Noemi and Derek, I would love for you to uh, spark the conversation by considering a really important question that we ask all of the speakers that uh, and, testa and those who give testimony with Together We Remember. And it is, what does never again mean to you? It is a phrase that is invoked often on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, as well as other survivors of genocide and mass atrocity all around the world and in other social issues. So from your perspectives and your life experience, what does never again mean uh, to you and in your eyes? Um, sh shall I start, Noemi? I think for me, it is, it's a never ending call to action. It's, it's, there's a sense of finality about it. And the finality is that our vigilance should never cease. That this can happen, this has happened, and this should not happen. And we must take steps to prevent it happening. And Noemi and I have a philosophy where we say, act while it is still safe to do so. Because Hitler came to power and destroyed all forms of communication. He destroyed the, the unprejudiced judiciary, the media. He shut down all forms of action. And if only people had been able to act before he did that, then the Holocaust would never have happened. I think from the, I agree with you, Derek, and thank you. And I think from the survivor's perspective, immediately after the Holocaust, it certainly was never again. And, and that was the reason that my late father spoke twice yearly. And my mother said sometimes he just came home and lay down or he wouldn't speak um, because he was obviously had to relive it. And each time a survivor speaks, they give a piece of their soul and their flesh to that. Sadly, we've seen that we've had genocides since it's not been the Holocaust. And I think we always have to be proactive to never again. Now it's 76 years since liberation of Auschwitz. And it feels, especially to young people, and it is to young people, a long time ago. And so I agree with Derek that we have to act and we have to educate because I do say, usually in my talks, that we are inherently prejudiced. We don't like difference. And so we need to educate people about difference, i.e. that if we don't like difference, you don't need to hurt difference um, and you certainly don't need to murder difference. So as Derek says, dialogue is extremely important. And usually when you are not in your echo chamber, how much more interesting is it, isn't it? How much more do we learn? And I always say our learning goes up exponentially. It doesn't even double. It, it, it's inspiring and it's, it motivates us to grow. 
without different, we don't really grow. And so we have to be proactive to never again. And, and that can be taken up in different forms, but it takes courage, friends. It does take courage. It does take education to not to be a bystander, to speak up, to speak out, or just to smile at somebody and show a quiet uh, face of saying, I'm here with you, it can take many forms. Darren. Thank you both. Um, what, so the next question that I wanted to ask is, you know, related to what we're seeing play out in the world today. I think many of our viewers would agree that we are living in a time of heightened political tension, social conflict, environmental destruction. And so what I wanted to ask each of you is sort of what aspects of wisdom from your community, from your cultures, from your life experience could be instructive in this moment, um, you know, this generational moment in which survivors of the Holocaust are passing away and we're seeing the rising tide of hate and anti-Semitism um, and other bigotries around the world. What sort of lessons uh, and wisdom might you share with our audience today? Shall I, shall I start? Now? Go ahead, Derek. Yeah. Um, I, th I think one, one useful model from, from this side of the Atlantic is the, the, the program that's been set up by the UK's Holocaust Educational Trust where they encourage schools to put forward young people as ambassadors. And then the ambassadors find out about the Holocaust. They will even go on a trip to Auschwitz and they come back and they act as spokespeople to tell their peers, the people, their friends, the people in their schools about what happened. So I think that's a, a very good system. Obviously in the States, you don't have the immediacy of the places where these things happened. So in Germany, for example, every high school student is supposed to visit the concentration camp. Now that can happen in Germany, it can happen in Poland, it can happen in various European countries. It can't happen in the States. So there has to be a degree of imagination about how to teach the Holocaust. And as you say, David, the Holocaust survivors are now passing away. We have their, their written testimony, we have spoken testimony, but the story now passes on and it passes on to, to Noemi's generation, to my generation, and then it needs to pass on to the next generations. The story of the Holocaust, the, the factors that drive genocide and the need for, for understanding. Derek, you actually said something very beautiful from generation to generation, which is a very Jewish thing. And we say it particularly during Passover, when we recount the story, we pass it on from generation to generation. And it's very much part of Judaism. But I think it's an extremely important way of teaching and learning. And I think anybody who has witnessed a Holocaust talk or um, has read something almost can become an, uh, an ambassador and can pass that message on. And that each of us need to take that responsibility, not only Derek um, with his past or me with my past or David here with his past, each of us can take on that responsibility of being the person who reflects back to their own inner conscience. Derek's grandfather adopted the conscience of the land. The Nazis, their mantra came from a form of hatred, but they justified it. They were a people of culture and intellect, but they justified it. They would say that when concentration camps are established, they're there to protect the larger population. They're there to protect the Germans from those vermin type of people. And so it's part almost, they, even though they were a civilized society, they, they made their message into a civilized message. Yet to act like that is a lack of civilization. So be brave, be, be true to yourselves when it's safe for you to do so. And the other thing that I want to say is maybe David, that is another question of yours, is, is 
we can layer education. We can start in primary school and we don't have to start with the atrocities, but we can teach basic human kindness, how to be with people, like bullying, like, like, like what to do when we don't like different. So there's lots that can be done. Speaking of what can be done, this is my final question to each of you before we open it up. We've got questions coming in. A reminder, folks, please, please use the Q&A function uh, and we'll, we'll get your questions answered by Noemi and Derek um, as soon as possible. Um, speaking of action, at Together Remember, our mission is to turn collective memory into collective action, especially on Remembrance Days, um, across lines of difference doing this work. And so for each of you, what is sort of your call to action um, in the advocacy work that you're doing? How might we be allies with you in our work or what what might you love to see from the students and the educators and um, folks watching today um, moving forward after this program may i start naomi yes I, th I think i'm going to follow the wisdom of a holocaust survivor i was speaking this time last year without naomi to a, a jewish girl, girls school and the speaker before me was a survivor. And one of the girls asked the survivor, what can we do to prevent the Holocaust? And the survivor said, talk to people who are not like you. Talk to people from different backgrounds, from different religions, with different ideas. Get to know them, understand them, make friends with them. And I think that's the fundamental thing, is to not fire off angry tweets or bitter words on Facebook or, or condemn people without giving a chance to, to speak. It's really about showing respect to all people. And I think that is fundamental. And we've seen in politics on our side of the Atlantic, on your side of the Atlantic, a confrontational approach that is a shameful example to any young person. Adults behaving with dreadful behavior, and that shouldn't be the case. Noemi. Um, I, I think, David, can you tell me the question again, please, just that I focus, what can be done? Yeah, what, our, what is your call to action for folks viewing today, Ray? Our mission is to turn remembrance into action. So from your perspective, what would you have folks, to, um, you know, move forward with? I, I, I think um, the action can be almost what I hinted at before, is, 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 to, is to speak up and speak out. And you can do it in any way that you're comfortable with. But I also think it's important initially to be given those skills. So I would call for the teachers in schools to empower your students, to give them to the skills to speak up and out, or to express themselves in any way that they're comfortable. It can be done through art, through sport. It shouldn't be just taught in history. It should be taught throughout the curriculum. In Yiddish, we have a saying, it's to be taught to be a mensch. And that's the basic, to be a decent person. And that's why I talk about layering in education. That's why it has to start in primary school. When you get to my age, you remember loads about primary school. So it's really, primary school is actually a very important place. I know here we speak to universities and then we go on to high school where we can enlarge. And in universities, we should have an area of safe debate where we can really explore and maybe say things that feel dangerous or terrible. But if we have the lecturer there and we have the right environment, everything can be said as long as we don't hurt each other or we incite hatred. So I think it's really important to have dialogue and to communicate. Thank you both so, so much. I now want to use the remainder of our time for the wonderful questions that have come in and they continue to come in. Um, also, as a heads up, everyone, we're sharing in the link 
uh, in the chat links to uh, uh, Naomi, Naomi, Naomi's father's book, The Long Night, as well as Derek's book as well. Um, and you can learn more about their stories and backgrounds as well. Um, so the first question that I would like to share is the following, and I think a number of folks are probably wondering this. Um, both of you could be called unlikely allies, given your family's backgrounds. Have either of you faced any criticism from friends, loved ones, or others for your willingness to speak in partnership with each other? Naomi, would you like to start? So, uh, well, I was very lucky. I, I um, told my mother, obviously, that I was going to meet Derek and his lovely wife, Sarah. The three of us have become good friends. Not only have they become my friends, they're one of the very few confidants that I have. So I really value that. And I had my mother's blessing. Um, the first meeting wasn't so easy because um, even though I approached Derek, and I wanted to meet Derek and I knew it was right. I had a visceral reaction where I felt very uncomfortable. And so I had to, once I got to know Derek more and Sarah more, all that melted away. But I had myself preconceived ideas that I was grappling with and um, fighting with. Um, and so that's gone. My mum obviously gave me, I told my mum, she gave me her blessing. Derek and I presented at the Holocaust Education Trust in London in front of Ambassador and unbeknownst to both of us, I think, survivors were there. And I was really worried what they would think, but they gave us the thumbs up. Not only did they give the thumbs up, they shook Derek's hand and I think some of them embraced. Subsequently, Derek and I presented together at a synagogue where also a lovely survivor spoke before us and they actually embraced afterwards. So our message is, is powerful. We come from different places, but we unite in our messages and our beliefs and our ideas and our concerns. Over to Derek. And, and for me, the greatest support has actually come from my brother's, my father's surviving brother, um, who adopted two little girls after the nuclear holocaust or explosion uh, accident at Chernobyl, the kind of thing that Hitler would have condemned. And my uncle read the draft of my book, said this is very hard, but it is the truth and you must tell this story. And he and his wife, when lockdown is over, are doing their best to encourage Noemi and I to go to Germany and speak together, and they are trying to arrange this. Um, on the topic of this question, I know that my grandfather, when he would speak and visit concentration camps that he had experienced and lived through and survived, um, and he often met many of those German students that had to visit those camps as part of their education experience and life experience. And I'll never forget a story that my grandpa told me about how um, a young woman approached him and just was in tears and crying and apologizing over and over and asking if my grandpa hated her. Um, and my grandpa said, no, I don't, I don't hate you, um, that you're not responsible for what happened to me, but you're responsible for what happens next. Um, and I thought that that was a really beautiful way of putting it um, in a very empowering, positive way. And it's something that I think all of us, whether we're in the United States or other countries around the world that has legacies of, of genocide and mass atrocity in our land, um, you know, how we can approach these difficult questions and issues um, with, with sort of maturity and responsibility. Um, so I just wanted to share that little, that little insight um, in honor of my grandpa today. Uh, the next question that I wanted to ask is, um, someone is curious and also i think others may wonder have you encountered holocaust deniers um in your in your lives and if so what have you how have you reacted in those moments and if not how would you react if someone sort of said to you that the holocaust did not happen or was distorting memory of the holocaust we haven't together ever come across a holocaust survivor denier, denier. No, we haven't together. Um, I think it's very difficult. I think the only way you can, you can't argue with them because they will always have their own facts which are totally distorted and pseudosciences of particularly, they like to use the Auschwitz gas chambers where they say the cyclone was used in this way and not enough and the sizes. So you can give them stories, but you know, it's another form of hatred really. It's another form of, hatred against Jews, 
of anti-Semitism, distortion, denial, it's, it's, it's cloaked up as just that. And so I always say it's difficult to speak to. For me, these sorts of people are extreme extremists because, uh, you know, they're haters, basically. It's very hard to educate people who are so extreme. It almost needs specialist type of educator. But I want to appeal to people who are of reasonable mind and educate them and allow them on the stories that they hear to make their own choices. Um, one of the final questions that I wanted to ask before we close out is um, several folks have, have posed this question. Do you see the same thing happening in the United States as many people claim that our democracy is slowly being dissolved by fascism? So taking on this question of connecting the past to the present, um, you know, how, how do you perceive this moment? And it's important to hear from folks who are not based in the United States on this perspective, as I'm sure you're seeing, um, you know, things play out. Um, shall, I, shall I start? Yeah. Um, we, we watched what was happening three weeks ago on Capitol Hill in disbelief. Was this America? Was this the United States of America? A government building being stormed by a mob? Could you have imagined that just a few years ago? Could you have imagined it a year ago? And I think that really said to us in the UK just how fragile democracy is, just how close we all are. And we are the same in the UK, just how close we are to a breakdown in civilized society. I agree. I agree with you, Derek. I found it utterly shocking. And um, of course, um, from what we saw on our news was that uh, President Trump invited this mob and encouraged this mob to come. And that, that scares me when a leader of, of the land um, encourages this sort of behavior. In Britain, um, Christmas a year ago, we were facing elections and the climate has changed when uh, Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party. And Jewish people were very afraid and uh, didn't know uh, what to do when Corbyn came to power. Many people, and um, that is secular Jews, said they would leave the UK if Corbyn came to power because it affected our very existence. It was interesting to see that uh, non-Jewish people couldn't quite feel or understand Jewish people. And that was visible to me on Facebook when a Jewish journalist um, asked her colleagues what they thought and of Jeremy Corbyn. And they said, uh, we feel very sorry for you, Karen, but we're going to vote for Corbyn because he's good for our health service. He's good for our education. He's good for all sorts. So they couldn't really understand that he threatened our very existence, our very education, our very health service, our very justice, our very everything. And so there's still a lot that needs to be done. And, and I go back, I'm a bore to education, 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 and we're in the right place here. Thank you both. I think it's important when we consider, um, you know, comparisons with the with past chapters of history that we perhaps look at history not so much in a comparative sense, but in an integrative sense to understand that the past informs the present, and that we have a responsibility to apply the lessons of the past to the present. We have not resolved the issues that we have inherited over generations and the legacy of um, of genocide, mass atrocity, and violence. Uh, that um, that really is anchored in white supremacy and white nationalist sort of thinking that was distributed across the world hundreds of years ago and involved slavery, uh, involved the genocide of indigenous peoples across the world, involving the, and also the Holocaust and other genocides, um, that has not entirely gone away and we have to face and reckon with that history. So at TWR, we're very passionate about advocating for an integrative understanding of history to know that Adolf Hitler was inspired by the Jim Crow South in the United States and studied the Armenian genocide and the lack of response from the global community, right? So these chapters inform each other and it's important for us to learn about all of them. Um, we have plenty of other questions, but I want to be mindful of time. Thank you both so, so much for, for joining us today. 
this was uh, truly an empowering uh, and inspiring program on a day in which we remember the past, but hope to inspire action in the present to shape a better future. I see in the chat, um, folks are curious if there's ways to reach out to you both. Um, would you like to share if there's a way for folks to, to get in touch? Yes. Sure. What's can the email for folks to, uh, to reach out to you, Noemi and, and Derek? We can email this out afterwards as well. We can give our email addresses, yeah. Okay, great. Or mine, um, anyway. I can only speak for myself, Derek. Yeah, me too. Me too. Very, very happy. Yeah. Wonderful. So feel free to drop that into the chat. Um, if you just select panelists and attendees in the chat, and you can share uh, your email addresses as well as your any links that you would like to. And in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just share with folks uh, what they can expect um, coming up next. Uh, so I'm sharing that slide that I had shared earlier. Um, so this program was. Uh, the very first uh, to kick off the Ohio Remembers Initiative, um, which will be running between now and April 2021 during Genocide Awareness Month. And our hope is that uh, we're able to turn remembrance into action together, bridge the gap between education and action as, as Noemi referenced, the importance of educators to support their students to act with moral courage. Uh, on February 15th, we have a training for educators for how uh, they can adapt our methodology of turning remembrance into action by hosting virtual vigils uh, with their classes and in their schools. We've got a variety of programs that will be coming up as well, a 10-year anniversary celebration of the lickman Baim Genocide Lecture Series, which was sparked by uh, my grandfather and his liberator, Don Baim, an alum of Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio. We also have faculty from Heidelberg University, incredible professors who will be sharing asynchronous mini sessions on different subject matter uh, related to uh, the context that led up to the Holocaust, the Holocaust itself, and other really important subjects that can be used in the classroom. Then on March 23rd, we have the, uh, the official lickman baim Genocide Lecture Series um, lecture, uh, which will be focused on the Armenian genocide this particular year. And then all April, there will be virtual events happening all around the world by our partners, uh, which will be available to you all, including a bunch of programs curated by the Together We Remember Youth Action Network. So high school and university students all over the world collaborating to bring really relevant programming that speaks to this moment and allows folks to, uh, students to feel connected with their peers around the world and, and inspired and uh, empowered to take action. And finally, our contact info. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Together We Remember and these programs, we will be sharing uh, an updated web page about this entire initiative uh, within the next couple of days and weeks, uh, togetherremember.org. You can find us on social media at our uh, handle right there, as well as on Facebook if you just search Together We Remember. And you can email us uh, simply by shooting a note to hello at togetherweremember.org. Um, I love to close today's program by sharing a quote from Elie Wiesel, the Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor. And he um, often spoke about and said, when you listen, when you hear a witness, you become a witness. And so all of us today have, um, have heard stories from witnesses. I am a witness in a sense. Uh, Noemi is a witness. Derek is a witness. We've shared our stories with you. And now it's your responsibility uh, to make sense of that and to apply these lessons into your daily life to make never again a reality in your backyard and in your community. Um, if there's anything else that we at Together Remember can do to support you, whether you're an educator or a student or a community member, please reach out. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Together we remember. <laughs>